uh, which supports the Gerard Fisheries. And I'm concerned about how we're going to get the balance back. I mean, last year, Gerard's went down to 150. It is so nice to see people that share our values and, and our care for the land willing to stand up on stage and say so. And, uh, you know, this year's theme is, is, is collaboration, conservation, and this is what it's about. There's people from all walks of life standing up on this stage and, and sharing the same theme about fish, wildlife, and habitat. This is about collaboration. Today, in the room, you'll see Scott and Michael Schneider. Michael's president of GOBC. You'll see trappers. You'll see wild sheep. You'll see bow hunters. And that's the way of the future, is we're going to have to work together. And we should, because together, we will fix and change this province. So when it comes to natural resource management, you need three things. You need money, science, and social support. It doesn't matter if it's water, air, trees, fish, and wildlife. Those are the three things you need. So you need money so you can do science, make evidence-based decisions, and you need social support. And the social support piece basically means people who advocate for the resource, who take care of it, and who get along to ensure that it's there for future generations. For decades, First Nations, resident hunters, guides, naturalists, all the people who care about fish and wildlife have all been telling each other what you're doing is wrong. And while they've all been fighting, it's been disappearing. It's still happening. I went and met with naturalists last week, and they still wanted to talk about the issues around hunting. I said, that's fine, we can talk about that. But the strategy in the past has been, we're going to fight over what each other is doing. That doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for me, it doesn't work for my kids. So at some point, we're going to have to realize that the car accident doesn't work for fish and wildlife. We've tried it. For 40 years, it doesn't work. Wildfire plays a critically important function in our ecosystems. It contributes to wildlife habitat in many, many different ways. Fires vary amongst forest types and in different climate units of the province. And so we can't use the same treatments everywhere because fires are different in one forest compared to the other. We can summarize or we can group the way those fires are functioning in different parts of the forest or at different parts of the province so that we can learn from one another, however. When we come up with strategies that we think are effective, we're going to have to consider the cumulative effects and the compounding influences of, of human actions on our landscapes. We need to work across scales and involve multiple agencies. So the collaboration that's the theme of this conference is incredibly important in this context. So the board, Marlene is part of our board and a number of others, we went through our board priorities for this coming year and we've determined that we're going to investigate issues around wildlife management in BC. So we can generally describe it as wildlife management in the province, is it effective for now? We're going to be working on those terms of reference uh, hopefully by the end of this year, early uh, 2018 and starting the work immediately thereafter and when we do get our terms of reference done we will be approaching the BC Wildlife Federation, the Guide Outfitters of BC and other parties like the BC Trappers Association to get some of your thoughts and viewpoints on wildlife management so that we can tailor our terms of reference plus our investigation to address the issues that are topical to you. As president of the Wildlife Stewardship Council I realize the importance of bringing people together to achieve the goals needed to build a relationship with government as well as the organizations within British Columbia to ensure wildlife comes first. It's very vitally important that we do that. In the system of conservation, we have to do as has been done in the past, namely at looking at all the elements and we must not believe that we are doing us or anybody a great favor by sitting down, looking at a piece of landscape, folding our arms, doing nothing about it, and thinking this is management. It's not. We have to have the courage to do some active management because right now on our protected uh, national parks, caribou are going extinct because we do not dare interfere with predators, for instance, yeah? But we have to. Bull River is a real interesting community. Um, people there, they, they, uh, you know, they love these sheep. They, they're, the, they're the sheep in the backyard all winter long. Um, they know that they're a, a good indicator species of a healthy grassland. 
So um, this project will give us a chance to kind of outreach with that local community. This is a photo of a sign that's on the side of the road just across from the Bull River Pub. And we'll hopefully be able to feed some of the information we're getting from this project into uh, this sign and other, other ways to connect with people to promote uh, awareness of the disease threat to kind of showcase some of the new research around uh, MOV. Local ownership, um, I think, is a, is a key thing, and I know many of you would agree. I think that we need to uh, basically, with others and in roundtable approaches, have a vision of what we want our watersheds and landscapes to look, look at uh, and implement the various, uh, uh, various science, the various policy research, and the advocacy, not only of this organization, but, but other organizations that have a common view to move the agenda forward. Thank you. Collaborate from the beginning. Don't fall into that trap of making a plan and then asking everybody else how they feel about it. Right? We've all experienced that. It doesn't work. We need to be in on the ground floor, all of us. Use a scientific, transparent, credible, and proven approach. All of these studies, the last one that I did, the data package was 168 pages. So any other scientist can go in there and replicate or work on that data. Go that way. You're going to get a lot better response. And there's no need to wait. We don't need to wait 10 years to figure out how to do cumulative effects. The tools exist and we're using them. So start just, we just need to use them. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We always need more data. Now, how much did the data actually get implemented into these plans like the Moose Management Plan? Well, it depends on the structured decision-making team that's sitting around making decisions. And you can see that when it comes to structured decision-making, that we do think about the scientific data. The scientific part of it's really important. And you can see it's the first one there bolded in black. But there's also things like socioeconomic values, value-based information, trade-offs are required, stakeholder values, our input into the situation and other interests must be considered. So like anything, it really depends if you're making decisions about wildlife, if you're trying to make this at a table, it really depends on who's sitting around the table like we were discussing earlier with this Wildlife Commission. So if some of the other interests are things like this and they're sitting around the table and they're saying, well, we understand that this is what you need for wildlife, but this is what we need to run the hospitals and the schools in this province then you've got, you've got an uphill battle that you might be fighting. Maybe not, maybe in some situations you can do it all. And if we look 40 years over our shoulder at the declines in fish and wildlife, the issues around cumulative effects around forestry, you can imagine what it will look like 50 years down the road if we don't change. If we don't set a path for BC to say, this is what we want, this is what we want it to look like, it's just going to get worse. So we said we want legislative objectives for habitat and fish and wildlife populations. Thompson steelhead should never get to 450 fish. Should never go below 1,000. So here's all the things we're doing. We have two networks, an elected officials network, which is people who are meeting with their elected officials all the time. And we're also talking to academics because there are people here that you've heard from who are willing to advocate for natural resources. So those people have said, we're willing to help you give you information so that you can advocate. But we know, even if we do all this, it's not enough. It won't be enough. If it's just Alan and I going to Victoria, it's not going to work. If we don't get you folks involved, we won't get change. So trying to keep it as short as possible. Are we losing what makes BC special? I would say, yeah, we are. Things are in decline. It didn't start five years ago. It started 40 years ago. Or 30 years ago. But the message behind that is your elected officials don't know who you are and they don't know how much you care about fish and wildlife. And hopefully what the numbers show you is that if people who care about fish and wildlife got together and met with their elected officials, you would get change. That's what the numbers show. They say we would get on board and that's what this funding model is about and that's what town halls are about is to try to convince these people. We, this year, did a collaboration with the Taltan First Nations, whose representatives will be here today, guide outfitters, and ourselves. And here's, I'm going to tell you how this actually works in, in reality. We, we formed a round table. There was concerns over data. 
the three of us wrote a letter saying we want about 150 grand to review the data that was done because nobody trusted it. 45 days later, the money came through. I guarantee you, if we did that as individual groups, it never would have happened. But together, we can't be ignored. And moving forward, with whatever our, the wildlife model might look like, and we'll build that together, they won't be able to ignore us. We won't allow us to be ignored because we're going to be standing side by side, all of us on the landscape. We have an MOU signed by all of us, and I invite Michael Schneider, John Henderson, um, Carl, get Jeff on the trappers, Chris Barker, you'd all come up. Five organizations with more to come, with one voice for wildlife. I think this is a historic moment, and uh, I'm proud to, that we could do this at our convention. So, uh, we need to be solutions-based. Just imagine all the great things that we could all do in support of fish, wildlife, and habitat if we checked our egos at the door, if we put aside our personal agendas, and we all rode that conservation boat together in collaboration as stewards of this land to conserve and protect the environment for present and future generations. So that is my challenge to you, the members of the BCWF for the coming year. As the voice of fish, wildlife, and habitat in BC, let collaborative opportunities and positive solution-based approaches guide you. It's been an honor to have shared the past couple of days with you, and I look forward to seeing and working with most of you in the coming year. Thank you.